My talk indeed will be on scholarly virtues and vices. That is on the virtues that scholars have to practice to do their work with integrity, as well as on the negative counterparts of those virtues, the vices that they have to avoid. Now, admittedly, virtues and vices are rather old fashioned concepts, terms that seem to belong to the 19th century rather than to the 21st century. Didn't Paul Valéry, the man you see here on the screen, great French writer, as early as 1934 declare in the French Academy, virtue, gentlemen, the word virtue is dead, or at least it is dying. Surprisingly, however, the concept of virtues has enjoyed something like a renaissance, a rebirth, also among research ethicists. If you survey the field of research ethics, not to mention literature on research integrity, responsible conduct of research, or responsible research and innovation, you find an ever increasing number of authors advocating virtue ethical perspectives. Bruce McFarlane was among the first to do so. Robert Panek of the so-called Scientific Virtues Project is another influential advocate. Or if you prefer an example closer uh, to home, the NRIN website features a news item on a Horizon 2020 program that seeks to enhance scholars' virtues through what they call a blended learning train the trainer program. Now, as you may know, research ethicists were not the first to dust off the old concept of virtue. From the early 1980s onwards, a growing interest in virtues can be observed uh, in a variety of fields, from ethics and political philosophy to educational theory and religious studies. Virtue ethics, most notably, has become a recognized field, just as more recently, virtue epistemology and its twin brother, vice epistemology. And in my own field, the field of history, virtues and vices are receiving ample attention too, especially among historians of science and historians of the humanities. And against this background, you might assume that research ethicists reflecting on virtues and vices are part of a much larger movement. Indeed, you might expect some lively interaction between the fields that I just mentioned. However, this expectation turns out to be overly optimistic. As I will argue in the first part of my talk, scholars discussing virtues and vices do not necessarily talk about the same things. In fact, if we zoom in on two examples, historians and research ethicists, we discover that they are engaged in projects that are so different as to have little common ground. Personally, I find that disappointing because I believe in the potential of dialogue across disciplines. If possible, I'd like to try to build bridges between fields, or in this case, between different takes on virtues and vices. So in the second part of my talk, I will argue that there is at least one important lesson that historians can learn from research ethicists and vice versa, one thing that research ethicists might learn from historians. And finally, by way of CODA, I will say something about a small project that my team at Leiden University is currently setting up, a little uh, self-advertising, if you don't mind, complete with an invitation to contribute. Well, first of all, who are the historians and research ethicists that I refer to? To give my um, remarks some solid empirical grounding, I will rely on a couple of case studies, all of which you uh, find mentioned on uh, the slide. McFarlane and Pannock are names that no one can avoid. Sarah Banks' paper is included because it adds a social science perspective to the discussion. On the historian side, my views are shaped by work that Lauren Dalston and Sari Kivisto, among others, have done. And of course, my own ongoing research at Leiden, where we have been working on scholarly virtues and vices for almost a decade now, features in the background uh, too. Now, you only need to glance through these various uh, publications to notice that historians and research ethicists are doing rather different things. Even if they all start from the present, from what we currently perceive as responsible conduct in academia, they proceed in opposite directions, so to speak. And whereas historians seek to historicize current views by uncovering their historical roots, ethicists are looking to the future 
with the aim of improving our current ethical discourse or practice. And this commitment to improvement marks the second difference. Whereas ethicists typically take an interventionist stance, historians prefer to study the world rather than to change it. And they do that for a reason, by the way. The history of their profession is full of examples that show how knowledge of the past is hampered by the wish to make historical knowledge directly applicable to the present. And perhaps most important, finally, is a third difference, a difference between what you might call uh, guiding questions. Whereas ethicists talk about scholarly virtues in the hope of fostering integrity in academia, historians use this type of virtue talk as source material that tells us something about moral codes or normative expectations in their development over time. For instance, if uh, Pannock, in his most recent book, An Instinct for Truth, presents curiosity as a key virtue for scientists, historians tend to think that's interesting. Curiosity used to be a vice, a temptation to which scholars ought not to give in. And now suddenly we have ethicists recommending curiosity. So what has happened? What does this transformation of a vice into a virtue tell us about academia, about the persona of the scholar, or about the evolution of moral standards in society at large? Now, these are a couple of differences, and none of the ones that are mentioned so far um, may be really unbridgeable. The two perspectives may be complementary rather than contradictory. But things get a little more complicated if we look in more detail at how historians and ethicists handle that term virtues. Ethicists use it as a first order term, as an analytical category that enables them to talk about, let's call it the demands that scholarly work makes on the self, on the scholar's uh, personality. Historians, by contrast, treat it as an actor's category, as a term that they encounter in their source material used by people in the past. And that has important implications. Unlike ethicists, for whom virtuous conduct is what matters in the end, Historians tend to focus not on people's actual conduct, which is often invisible to them with a distance of centuries, but on the term virtue as they encounter it in their sources. Historians write histories of moral idioms or moral vocabularies. They tend to study terminology instead of actual conduct. So if we take honesty as an example, ethicists would ask how important is honesty for academic integrity? And if it matters, how can we stimulate it? Historians, by contrast, would examine when honesty emerged as an ideal worth pursuing, how it was colored by romantic notions of authenticity, and why the gender connotations of this virtue have changed over time. That's what I describe on the slide as sort of mirroring broader cultural patterns, as distinguished from a more narrow focus on job-specific demands. And most disturbingly, perhaps, whereas ethicists publish one paper after another on how virtue can actually be taught to students, for instance, historians raise an eyebrow when they hear this question. They know that in the entire history of virtue, from Plato's dialogues in ancient Greece to Valéry's academy lecture that I just quoted, hardly anyone has ever dared to give a simple affirmative answer to the question whether virtue can be taught. So from the historian's point of view, the ethicist ambition to teach virtue in ethics courses, for instance, is rather disconnected from the centuries long history of virtue. So does that mean that historians and ethicists are like ships passing in the dark? Although they are of course not unaware of each other, the difference that I have highlighted and perhaps even exaggerated help explain why there is not as much interaction between historians and research ethicists as you might expect. And as a historian myself, and also someone who occasionally wears an ethicist hat, I find this lack of interacting really disappointing. So I wonder, is there something that historians can learn from ethicists and the other way around? I think they can. And the rest of my talk is an attempt to show how I envisioned it. I'll start with the historians and try to set up a kind of dialogue between them and their colleagues in ethics.
Well, if I try to summarize what historians bring to the table, perhaps their most basic insight is that scholars up until the 20th century, almost without exception, equated virtues with deeply ingrained dispositions. Virtues refer to character traits or habits of the mind that people slowly developed over time. Historically speaking, therefore, the concept of virtue was used not to discuss what must be done in this or that case, but to refer to attitudes and personality traits that operated somewhat invisibly in the background. Virtues do not tell you what to do. They are better understood as attitudes that have become second nature to you because you have been socialized in certain ways of living. Secondly, Despite a great variety of voices that we can distinguish across the centuries, Greek philosophers, medieval theologians, and 19th century men of science all had in common that they saw character as something formed primarily in early childhood. By and large, character was seen as a product of inherited traits, parental influences, and the environment in which a child grew up. And this understanding of virtue had a major implication on what professors could and could not teach their students. I've seen it time and again in 19th century source material. University teachers explaining that they can only cultivate virtuous traits that are already there. Their teaching, as well as their personal examples, could maybe help students further develop their habits of mind, but they could not create such habits ex nihilo, out of nothing in students who did not yet possess good character traits. So academic teaching, in other words, could refine but not reform existing habits of mind. And finally, given this understanding of character, it comes as no surprise that refinement of character was primarily associated with habits that students developed by doing things together or with their professors over extended periods of time. As Andrew Warwick has shown in his marvelous book on mathematical physics at Cambridge, field sports was seen as at least as important for developing intellectual habits as interaction in the classroom. Likewise, spending long days with a small group of dedicated researchers in a lab or weekly evenings in the professor's own house, that was the sort of experience that people saw as able to leave a mark on someone's character. No quick solutions, but long-term participation in habit-forming practices was seen as key to cultivating virtues. Now, that's a rather different world from the one in which research ethicists are currently discussing scholarly virtues. Without much reference to historical backgrounds, they appropriate this concept of virtue with the aim of enriching currently dominant ways of talking about integrity. Sarah Banks speaks for many, I think, when she argues that we talk too much about the integrity of research practices and too little about the integrity of researchers themselves, the people who actually do experiments, run surveys, and interpret data. Of course, the difference between research integrity and researcher integrity is minimal as long as scientists are assumed to be rule-following automata, people who stick to rules and conform to protocols. But this is, of course, a rather implausible view of how humans do their work. So for Banks and her colleagues, virtues are attractive because they offer an idiom for talking about demands that research makes on human beings, things of the motivation and perseverance that researchers need, or the hope and fear and other emotions that they invest in their work. In order to enable virtues to perform this role of correcting rule-based types of ethical discourse, ethicists do whatever they can to make this old concept of virtues fit for 21st century use. Panek, for instance, states quite explicitly that he wants to redefine virtues from what he calls heritable evolved tendencies acquired at young age into what he names cultivatable scientific habits skills that students can actually learn in, for instance, an ethics course. Also, instead of highlighting habituation, as people have done over the centuries, both Panic and Banks emphasize moral deliberation 
in the sense of critical reflection on scientific values and good practices. In line with these priorities, the ethic teaching modules that Banks and Panic envision revolve around three E's. The first E refers to examples. Panic wants students to read Darwin's autobiography or watch a movie about Einstein in the hope that they will model themselves after these virtuous examples. And although exercising, the second E, is not something really possible in a 90-minute ethics class, role-playing and Socratic dialogue are suggested as didactic formats that allow students to familiarize themselves with various virtues. And finally, evaluating from the critical perspective of a self-reflective practitioner highlights that ethical instruction can never amount to indoctrination. Unlike rules, which require compliance, virtues allow for negotiation and adaptation to local circumstances. Now, if I would ask my colleagues in history to respond to this, I can imagine that some would voice surprise or even skepticism. Whatever you can teach in 90 minutes, it's not virtue, or at least not virtue as conventionally understood. You will need to redefine the concept to make your argument work. That would be one response. But in a more generous mode, I think historians might argue that such redefinitions or reappropriations of old virtues in new contexts are in fact a recurring phenomenon. You see that across the centuries. Even if the distance between traditional and current usage is considerable, it is perhaps only natural that every generation recalibrates the concept with an eye to the challenges that it faces in their own time. So a more generous historian might argue that McFarlane and all the others actually do what 19th century scientists also did, bringing virtues in accordance with their own cultural biases, which in our case includes a preference for learnable skills over personality traits, among other things. Yet even this most generous historian cannot help but wonder how ethicists can realistically expect anything virtuous from a 90-minute exposure to exemplars of virtue if the dominant discourse in academia, according to this, these ethicists themselves, has so little room for virtue. If our scholarly selves are shaped by habits developed through repeated practice, then isn't the regular curriculum, not to mention the hidden curriculum and the examples of peers and professors, much more decisive than an occasional ethics class. Some ethicists appear to be keenly aware of this problem. John Nixon, for instance, argues that unless universities become, quote, institutions committed to creating and sustaining relationships based on truthfulness, respect, authenticity, and magnanimity, there is little chance for scholarly virtues to flourish. No ethics course will be able to remedy the vices that a system based on hyper-competition, careerism, and short-term profit thinking instills in students on a daily basis. In this line of reasoning, research ethics becomes a kind of countercultural practice, a form of critical thinking in the Foucauldian tradition, which is stronger in voicing worries and articulating protest than in developing feasible alternatives. Most ethicists, however, prefer a more pragmatic stance. Instead of presenting virtues as a remedy to perceived vices in the academic world at large, they try to discern what correctives or small-scale improvements are feasible within the current system, within current administrative, economic, political uh, circumstances. Panic, for instance, repeatedly emphasizes that a 90-minute class is not exactly ideal, yet better than nothing. Banks, on her turn, counters the charge of utopianism by proposing what she calls a virtue ethics light, in which the Aristotelian notion of virtue as excellence is replaced by the more modest concepts of ordinary virtues, personal qualities of the sort that every researcher possesses at least to some degree. And finally, following a trend that can also be observed in codes of conduct, New virtues, such as honesty, sincerity, and transparency, are almost universally preferred over older ones, such as impartiality and objectivity. 
characteristic of these new virtues is that they do not exactly aim to overcome bias, or at least not completely, but try to be transparent about it. Sorry, bluntly put, they demand acknowledgement of conflicting interest rather than that they expect scholars to be fully disinterested. So that's one answer to the historian's question. We ethicists try to be realistic, and that requires some fundamental rethinking of what we understand virtues to be. More interesting, however, and that's the final step before I come to my conclusion, is a question that ethicists might pose to historians. You write hundreds of pages on how our predecessors tried to fight vice and cultivate virtue. But that's all about the past. What about your own present? What kind of example do you give to your students? What virtues, if any, do you cultivate in your academic practice, in your teaching of history, for example? It's perfectly fine to avoid a type of didactism that turns history into a reservoir of moral lessons. So we understand that you prefer not to take a normative stance in your writings. Nonetheless, you are educating your students in a certain way. You are living out a particular way of being a scholar. Isn't it strange to write about virtues and vices in the past without reflecting self-critically on the virtues and vices that you yourself embody? Now, if you compare this question to the one that I hear historians raising, the communalities are not hard to detect. Whereas in my imaginary dialogue, ethicists are asking historians to reflect on the qualities that they themselves display in their work. Historians are challenging ethicists to think about virtues and vices induced by the academic system at large. So in both cases, I think, the question focuses not on lofty ideals, but on what is actually taking place on the university campus, in classrooms, libraries, and laboratories alike. In both cases, more precisely, the question is what habits, qualities, virtues, vices, and so forth, academics develop by running experiments, writing grant applications, reviewing journal articles, or teaching undergraduates? If there is any common ground between historians and research ethicists, this common ground is perhaps not to be found in ideals of virtue, which they are unlikely to agree, but rather in close attention to how academic cells are actually being molded in the routines of research, teaching, supervision, and the like. I therefore agree with um, Louise Zuiderhout and Dori Baylor in the article mentioned on the slide that ethnographies of academic life might give a major impetus to virtue ethical um, discourse and dialogue. We need ethnographic accounts, not only of laboratory life in San Diego, this refers to Bruno Latour's and Steve Bulger's famous book, Laboratory Life, but also of PhD students trying to get their articles published, postdocs writing grant applications as if their lives depend on them, adjunct professors grading undergraduate exams into the early hours, or administrators trying to take an institute through financially tough times. Ethnographies or anthropologies of academic life can bring the historian's stories into the present, while at the same time providing ethicists with much needed insight into moral or not so moral habits that are actually induced uh, into us by our 21st century universities. So if anyone is interested in funding or carrying out such research, please let me know. This brings me to my um, two minute coda or shameless advertising for an initiative that emerges out of my current NWO project on scholarly vices. I don't have the money or the expertise yet to start an ethnographic project on virtues and vices. By way of alternative, however, my team has started inviting scholars from across the academic spectrum to write short pieces about virtues and vices that they perceive as being fostered in current academic life, within their field, at their own university, or in their research group. We ask them to identify one or more habits that they see being inculcated in them or in their students, and to share their thoughts on what is virtuous or vicious about these habits. Let me be perfectly clear, this is not a project with scientific ambitions. 
contributors are not methodologically selected and the assignment we give them is deliberately broad. It's not an attempt to create data, but rather an invitation to share stories in order to get some glimpses into current academic practice and to stimulate reflection, if only on our own virtues and vices. So it's not ethnography, it's auto-ethnography, with also in the double sense of being done by ourselves and with an eye on our own practices. The first stories have just been published on our website, virtuesandvices.nl. If you're interested in reading them, or even better, contribute to the blog, please visit virtuesandvices.nl and contact us through the website. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you.